look at it from dealing with it on a population uh, basis, right? Because these 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 issues are not happening in a silo. They're just not happening on their own. They're it's actually, about housing, it's about food, it's about access to healthcare, and staying in healthcare. That's right. Because a lot of times you don't stay. Right. It's exactly what you're saying. And what we're trying to do, create for the patients, is to have a medical home. What is your medical home? And by that we mean a place, just like you come home, and it's nurturing, and that's where your, your support system is. Your medical home should be able to take care of all of your needs and to be able to deal with everything that you're dealing with. So this is the beginning of that whole concept where everything is right here for uh, the patient. Again, one of the other things that makes this great when it comes to breast cancer so, treatment okay, and, <coughs> and follow-up is that all of your providers are right here. You know, I can't do my job without having expert uh, uh, radiology, expert imaging to diagnose these uh, the problems that the patients may have. And one of the things that I often say to women, it's one thing that you're going and getting your annual screening, but if it's not being done in a reputable place, so what? I've seen so many cases of patients in the black and brown communities that are going for the annual screening, but the cancers were missed. And these women thought they were doing the right thing, but the providers that they were going to are not expertly trained. So it's really important that when you are going for your screening, mm -hmm. right, which we, you know, we're now mm -hmm. approaching Breast Cancer Awareness Month, right. that you are going to a reputable place, that it is a, an accredited, institution that the people who are actually reading your mammograms are dedicated breast imagers that that's what they do they're not doing chest x-rays and cat scans and bones that this is all they do is breast imaging because it is a very specialized field and we know that in the hands of expert breast imagers or mammographers mm -hmm. the outcomes are better in terms of picking up cancers or and that's why I'm so annoyed with the I think it was the National Medical Association when they said a few years back that um, women didn't have to have regular mammograms as they as we were doing. Yeah. And I said, Oh no. Yeah. They still we still need to do it. The American Medical Association is not the authority on this. Yeah. And I think part of the problem with that is that that those initial recommendations the right those initial those initial recommendations were based on data from people that didn't look like us mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. a lot of that data came from European countries that you don't need to do annual mammography when in fact those countries don't have people that look like us because while white women have the highest rates of breast cancer in the country black women have the highest rates under the age of 40 mm -hmm. so to tell young black women that they don't need to get screened when in fact they have a higher rate of breast cancer at earlier ages was not a good idea. Keep it coming back. So we have bone scans, ultrasounds, and we have mammography. Can we just show the mammogram machine? Sure. Come on in. So again, we have state of the art 3 3D. Right, 3D imaging. Okay, this is where the patients and <laughs> one of our Expert Hello. technicians Hello. with us, yeah. Hello. yeah. And then we do biopsies right next door. Okay. And again, all 3D system. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. Stereotactic biopsy is just means that the um, the patients are put into this. Ah. The patients are put into the table, mm -hmm. right? The breast hangs to mm -hmm. the hole. But stereotactic means that it's being done in, they're able to localize it stereotactically mm -hmm. so in a grid. What determines if a patient needs to be examined stereotactically? Uh -huh. um, 
mostly if we're going to do a biopsy, if it can be done under ultrasound, it's easier. Okay. But some things can't be seen on the ultrasound. It can only be seen on the mammogram. For example, calcifications, right. which is something many women have heard they have calcifications when they get a mammogram. Those calcifications have to be localized stereotactically, meaning you need an x-axis, a y-axis, to be able to find, pinpoint the exact location in the breast, and then the needle is then able to go in gotcha. stereotactically and just sample uh, that area. So today, why we are seeing more and more women being diagnosed with breast cancer earlier is because with the new imaging techniques that we have with 3D mammography, for example, you can see through the breast tissue so much better now than you did before. For example, in our first year of 3D imaging, which we started about three or four years ago, in our very first year, we had an increase of positive biopsies by about, I think it was something about, somewhere between 60 and 80% increase in just one year. We were finding things that conventional mammography wasn't able to see. So now you only offer 3D here now? Only 3D. Excellent. And we also have the only mobile mammography program in the Bronx. So we have a van that is going out doing imaging. Um, How often is the van out? Today? The van is out all the time. We hit every zip code in the Bronx every single year. So every single year, every zip code in the Bronx is hit. And we do some legwork ahead of time to meet with churches, community boards, organizations to make sure they know we're coming, we get people registered ahead of time. And those women, regardless of insurance, get their screening because New York State does pay for, uh, for annual screening mammography regardless of a woman's ability to pay. So you've been doing a 3D prep for me three years now. So how long have you been doing the stereotactic? Oh, we've been doing stereotactic for years. That's that's not new technology, but that it's in 3D now is new, right? That we we're doing it everything in 3D. One of the new we are, one of the new technologies that we also have is how I do the procedure in the operating room now too, because before many places you still had to depend on putting wires into the breast in order to operate. So now we have something called MagFeed that we're doing here where. We put a magnetic seed into the breast. We put a magnetic seed into the breast where the abnormal finding is, and then I use a little handheld probe, and I can pinpoint exactly where I need to cut in the breast to remove the abnormal area. And I now have technology, rather than sending the specimen to them to be imaged to make sure I got the lesion, I'm now being able to image the specimen right in the operating room I can tell if I got it or not, and I transmit the image to them. I'm operating across the street, transmitting the image to them, and they're telling me in real time, you got everything, you're good, you can close oh, surgery. So if you're coming for breast screening, we could capture you for cervical cancer screening. We can make sure you have your GYN exam as well. And then I see, this is where we see patients over here. <coughs> Obviously, my rooms, you can tell. <laughs> um, so the, I see patients along here, and then plastic surgery, right, because for those patients that need reconstruction, mm -hmm. they're on the other side. So we're see seeing patients at the same time, so the patients don't have to worry, they have need a mastectomy, they need reconstruction. It's all, both myself and the plastic surgeon are here to see you at the same time to deal with all of that, okay? And for so like- So roughly how many um, surgeries Breast for breast cancer, I would say somewhere between 150 to 200 cases a year. Yeah. Yep. <coughs> um, not all of them need mastectomy, obviously, right. because they are, um, you know, we're picking up so much early stage disease today. Not everyone needs a mastectomy. Today, right now, these rooms, since normally I would be in the operating room, these rooms are actually being used by our OMM team um, to do body work and massage therapy on both uh, the, the breast cancer patients, the postpartum patients after labor and delivery to get their bodies back in order. It's sort of a, a energy work that they do on the patients. To so how many days are you ready? 
I see I see patients on two days, clinically Wednesdays and Fridays. Okay. I'm in the operating room on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then Monday because I'm also the program director of the general surgery residency. That's my administrative day to work on all the administrative things that I have to do in, in my position. Hello. Pleasure to meet you. Nice to meet you. Oh, we have a wonderful tour of this center, and of course, your doctor. <laughs> my wonderful teacher. doctor. Hey, now, I like that. And I'm happy to be an FOB, friend of birth. And uh, we're here today, and he has really shown us the center, and it is just so incredible in terms of the work that definitely had a wonderful experience um, here at, at the Wellness Center at SPH. Dr. Peterson has been amazing. In 2018, I was diagnosed um, with breast cancer. Thank God it was stage one. Um, it was a routine checkup. Um, and they found, well, then I had to do a mammogram and they found that I had breast cancer mm -hmm. right away. We met up and we were able to um, come up with a, a, a treatment plan. What are we going to do? And I thought that was really good mm -hmm. because it was not what the doctor wanted to do, but it was what I wanted to. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was a part of everything. Mm -hmm. So, what are the treatment options? What do we do? You know, so um, I'm sorry, I was. It's a little emotional sometimes when oh, I think absolutely. about <laughs> when I think relate. about breast cancer. <laughs> Um, but I do want to say something, mm -hmm. mention, you know, highlight something that she said. It was found on a routine checkup. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, that, I don't want that to be missed because mm -hmm. sometimes women ask, but I had my mammogram last year, but that's why we have you come every year. Right. And the fact that she was stage one was because it was a routine checkup. Mm -hmm. that she was, <laughs> Francesca was in fact coming every year mm -hmm. and we were able to catch it at an earlier stage. And it's, it wasn't as simple as, oh, I, I, I'm feeling something, pain, but it, it wasn't like a lump or anything like that. I just felt pain. And, and when I went to do my physical, doctor, um, I forgot her name. Yeah, my doctor, she was able to, right away, let's, let's make sure that we do this correctly. Um, and, and it's, Dr. Peterson was my surgeon. Again, he was amazing. I, I, I really appreciate um, he was there for me after the surgery. He made sure that I was okay. He came back and spoke to me, spoke to my family, spoke to my husband. Mm -hmm. My parents were there. Um, yeah. So that was that was really good. I had a, I had a phenomenal experience. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was uh, definitely Dr. Bird and I will just interject here. Uh, I am a breast cancer survivor, so mine was picked up very soon. So I'm glad to see you and 
Thank you for sharing your story. <laughs> Thank you so and, you much. Know, I just want to say something about this whole thing about delay. It was one of the things that we dealt with from the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Because many oh, women yes. many women didn't come in to get their screening right, yes, right. during the pandemic. And we saw a lot of advanced stage disease. And the women actually told us they felt something. Mm -hmm. They were concerned, but they were too afraid mm -hmm. to come in. We stayed open the entire time, and we made it very known for the community, we're here for you. Mm -hmm. But people were very afraid, and it was one of the things that we're seeing as a result of the pandemic is the later stage uh, disease as well. You know, so I would encourage women that you know, might still having it to please go in and get your screening and, you know, find a place that can take care of you because I don't know, it, it is a problem that we've seen. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I've been hearing more about that, that because of, you know, the pandemic, we were not going to screen for breast cancer and other yeah. health issues and so forth. And now we go to uh, centers, hospitals, and take care of the That's correct. At least doing more comfortable. But you were very, very, um, you're very fortunate. You stayed open throughout the, the pandemic. Entire time. Yeah. And, um, and the hospital also allowed me to operate on breast the patients who were concerned about having breast cancer mm -hmm. or who had breast cancer. Because while elective surgeries for many other people were mm -hmm. uh, shut down, right. I will say I was fortunate to have the hospital administration say, first they agreed to let the breast cancer patients have their surgery and uh, and then all other cancer patients follow suit. Um, the only thing that was impacted for me during the pandemic was the cosmetic aspects. If a woman needed a mastectomy, we couldn't do, normally today we do the reconstruction at the very same time. We weren't able to offer that because of the, the limitations on the services that we had available. So the patients then, after the pandemic, things started to be relaxed, we were able to do reconstruction at a later date. So though anyone who needed reconstruction and wanted it, ultimately did get it. Well, I am just so pleased for you, Ms. <laughs> Francesca. <laughs> I, I am very, very pleased with um, the treatment and the follow-up. Follow-up is very important. Mm -hmm. Every six months I get my mammal a mammogram and then I do an MRI. Right now it's every six months for now. So breast MRI has become almost gold standard also in the evaluation of a patient to make sure she doesn't have breast cancer in those patients who are diagnosed with breast cancer. Just about every patient is getting an MRI today. We also do offer breast MRI here as part of the comprehensive approach to the, the screening, the diagnosis, and the treatment. And I think what's important, as we've been discussing throughout, is that entire process of screening, the diagnosis, the surgery, the treatment, the follow-up, because if one drops off, you can see the difference. You know, it's got to be the follow-up. And then as women, we have to stay with that right. and be mindful of it and not willing to just say, okay, I went through that now. This is that, you know. So I think that is wonderful and I'm very, very impressed with everything I've been seeing and hearing with respect to the work that's being done. And that's right. Dr. Patricia has to say, you know, it is the health home, the medical home, it's all right here together. And it's, this is the kind of thing that I think needs to be promoted more. Yeah. I agree. It really agree. does. Because it does make a difference. As a woman or a person or individual with breast cancer have other needs. Yes. Housing, exercise, mm -hmm. mental health. I was just thinking that. You know, correct. everything that is a package. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I see that's being offered here. Yeah. Yeah. That is exactly what I see being offered here. So I thank you so much. Mm -hmm. particularly proud of the fact that we were able to do this in the South Bronx, right? And I think more communities of color that are dealing with the health of black and brown people, this is the kind of infrastructure projects that we need to think about and not just about screening and education anymore. 
you know, and I think Black Health can actually le be the leader of advocating for this, you know, with no, uh, no, like, because this is what I talk about a lot, like, we're about education and awareness, but I fully recognize that that's just the beginning. Yes. If we can educate people, make them more aware, then hopefully they can start engaging in their own health issues immediately. Yes. But also prevention. That's right. People, you think they know this? You think they understand this? Yeah. And that education and awareness is not important? Yeah. But it is critically important. And that's what a lot of funding sources don't like to give money for anymore. Absolutely. And that creates a stop gap between getting to you and what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. So this is really great. And I think and I think when people talk about affordable care, I'm more interested in equal access, equal access to quality health care. It's one care. thing to give people insurance and give them access to care, but if that care is not up to par, exactly. it doesn't it doesn't you know lead to good health care outcomes and also. We know that racism impacts good health care. Absolutely. Because we see many stories, especially as it relates to maternal health, yes. where women with means have experienced some of the same problems yes. as women with no means or socioeconomic at the lower end. Yeah. Not believing their pain, not being given the care, and some of them have actually died. Absolutely. So it's race that comes into play right. in all of this, especially with black women and Hispanic women. Yeah, because even when that. it comes to that whole issue of maternal and fetal health, you're right, even black women of means yes. do, Look at do, Serena. Yeah, do work. What she had to go through. Yeah, absolutely. So again, when you're looking at a patient's overall health, right, you have to look at it. Do they have a safe place to live? Do they have food a to eat? Home. A health yeah. home. A, 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 health, a, a healthy home and a medical home mm -hmm. is, is what... what what leads to good health outcomes. Yes. I'd like to just show you some of what else we offer to deal with okay. some of the issues that go into impacting a patient's overall health, okay? So we know, for example, in the Bronx, the Bronx has the highest rates of obesity. Mm -hmm. The Bronx has the lowest rates of people doing exercise. And we know that obesity is one of those things, for example, and lack of exercise and physical activity contributes to overall health mm -hmm. in a bad way, mm -hmm. okay? Because while we're here talking about breast cancer today, the same risk factors with obesity, lack of exercise, contribute to heart disease, <coughs> it contributes to you know hypertension it contributes to diabetes the things that affect our people okay and many of my patients with breast cancer come in with all of these issues which also impact their survival overall and because of their overall poor health so here's the fitness center right in here where members of the community and hospital employees can come and exercise During the day right now, so it's a little empty, but in the evening it gets really busy as people are coming in after work from the community. And of course, on the weekends, it's open for the community in full. And they have a trainer. And they have a trainer. We have trainers here as well. Yeah. And then, as you can see through these windows, You have the opportunity to spend time outside and actually there's a, a walking track. So if you'd like to just walk, look at this, and then you can walk around. There's a walking track and then we have some exercise equipment buried within the garden that you can just see. I have a tire over here. You can do dips pull-ups, different things like that. 
we were a little slow getting started because of the pandemic and the, the uh, requirements of not having people, but um, I think there's something happening now. Oh, you can see. So the community comes and they get to cook. We made it nice, you know. <laughs> so this is the teaching kitchen. We are doing community classes that have a healthier take. They're open for the community. They're open for our residents and everybody that just has an interest in cooking. So here we have different stations. Everybody gets their own recipe um, and they're able to go home with one to three meals that are balanced, meaning they have protein, they have a green, they have a salad, and all of that is for five dollars. Yeah? Yes. They pay five. Five dollars and they go out with like three, four meals. Wow. And that happens on Tuesday. So we have classes Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. Um, the schedule varies. We have the morning class, an evening class, afternoon class. So we are trying to fit everybody into our schedule. And how, who has access to the class? Like who can sign up? Anybody? Or? So anybody. We have community classes that are open to anybody from ages five to 65. Um, we have a special program called the Healthy Living uh, Initiative that we are hosting people that are pre-diabetic, have malnutrition, things like that. So usually teenagers from age 12 to 21, they take a special class with introducing themselves to knife skills, cooking techniques, and different recipes that they could accommodate and go back home and cook for themselves. That's crazy. Okay. And this is stuff You're gonna that see I like. More. Yeah. So uh, this is, again, I thought, just genius that we did this, yeah. you know, to, again, looking at the and overall no health. no other such center. Not that I know of. And we already know that our communities of black and brown people uh, li mostly are in food deserts, right? Where there's not, <laughs> right, not great access to quality food yeah. or how to cook it. So we're addressing that here with the marketplace on the first floor, how to cook it on this floor, okay, so color coordinated exercises, you know, you get a trainer, you know, if you apply for one of the grants, you know, taking care of, recognizing the fact that you know, not everybody. Even though the cost of the gym, for example, is I think something like twenty dollars a month, that could still be a hardship for some people. Mm -hmm. So we do our best to take care of it. Oh, oh, I know. Yeah. People have their car. Oh, yeah, I've never been up here. So this is our community oh, wow. garden. Um, oh, this is lovely. Incredible, isn't it? And the beehives, the beehives are the beige boxes back there where we harvest our own honey. And it's. I had no idea what was up here. Now, so. This is where they grow food? Yes. And see, I am so. Uh, non related to this. I don't even know what that is that's growing. <laughs> So that would what be their collard greens section. Collard then, greens? Yeah, all their greens are in the front. And then they start with the vegetables. We do carrots, peppers, tomatoes, mm -hmm. eggplant. We have scallion, all the herbs. They have a whole herbal garden that's in the middle. Mm -hmm. And it progresses from there. And it varies depending on the season. This is a 20 for our 365 day initiative. Mm -hmm. Some things grow obviously better in the summer, but they also have plants that thrive all year round that they maintain. And if they cannot be, what's behind you is the greenhouse that they take the plants that need to be uh, kept in a warmer climate and they keep them in here. So this is, and this has is regulated
cultivate the soil and anything that they are able to harvest, they bring to the community. And on Wednesdays and Thursdays, they display in the first floor here. That's down there. Yes, yes. that's what you're going to be seeing in the right. lobby today. And anything left over, I think you said they donate. Yes, they donate to the local shelters mm -hmm. in the area. Okay. I and tell you, you can just come <laughs> here in this building, and this is just to be a light. Yes. You yes. got a house, you got a home, you got a medical care, you got food. Yeah. It's just <laughs> and in addition to the vegetables, they get pantry items and um, dairy items for them. Wow. And, it, and, and, I, and I love the fact that you have the view yeah. of Manhattan directly. Oh, that one's over there, yeah. yeah. Manhattan is that way, yeah. But this is our community. So I just wanted to make one comment. You know, the importance of a patient telling Denisha, it's so nice to see someone that looks like me. Because one of the things that I'm also proud of in terms of our outcomes is that our no-show rate for appointments is very, very low. The patients, when they're happy, when they see themselves with practitioners that look like them, understand them, they're more likely to show up for their visits. And that also contributes to a, a, a higher rate of early detection of breast cancer because you're showing up for your routine visits, because you're happy to come, because the people who are taking care of you understand you, they look like you, which is why it's so important that we also have to advocate as black health, we have to advocate for minority students in medical schools and getting the specialties that we concentrate a lot on primary care, but we need surgeons. We need cardiologists. We need interventional radiologists. We need these specialists <clears throat> in all different areas and not just in primary care, which is important, but we need them in all of the different specialties. Oh, I agree. Yeah. I say to my residents and students all the time this way. Yeah, when you're taking care of a patient, you're not taking care of a 52-year-old with stage two breast cancer. Mm -hmm. It's a 52-year-old with breast cancer who has, as you said, three children at home, five, uh, five children at home, husband has passed away, she's a primary breadwinner, and oh, by the way, grandma is also now living at home. And that whole approach, you know, and I'm reminded of a patient recently, 28 years old, just got married, diagnosed with breast cancer, doesn't have children, wants to have children, and now she's gonna need chemotherapy. And then we then do genetic testing and find out, which we offer here as well. She has a, a gene mutation, so she has to have both breasts removed. And she's dealing with a new marriage, a new relationship, her body mm -hmm. image. All of this comes into play. Because now we have to harvest eggs, freeze the eggs, so that she can still be a mother reconstruct the breast. You know, there's a lot of issues that go into you this. You have to deal with the relationship with that new right. husband. Exactly. How is he handling all of this? Exactly. So you're never treating the patient mm -hmm. in a silo. Mm -hmm. It's the whole family. Mm -hmm. It's the community that they live in. All of that has to be taken into account if you're going to really be holding yourself accountable for good health outcomes. Mm -hmm then you have to take care of the entire patient. I think that's the number, and I'm so glad to see yeah. young women young <laughs> uh, moving into this area yeah. because we, we so desperately need it. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you.